Well, good morning. Good morning. And good morning. hopefully these are all fresh faces and nobody's doubling back, but maybe you guys had a fun time learning about shoulder injuries, which I actually wanted to go over there myself. To, um, but anyway, we're going to have a talk about heart murmurs and palpitations. And, you know, this is, uh, I think, a small enough group where we can talk. If you have any questions or things that uh, get your attention along the way, feel free to stop me. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about this precious organ, the heart. It's a muscle. It's a pump. And so like all muscles, they squeeze and relax. And the heart is a strong pump that pumps about 2,000 gallons of blood a day in most of us um, in a normally functioning heart. And in an average lifespan of 70 years, the heart beats about 2.5 billion times. So that's a lot of opportunity for things to go awry and to cause uh, problems that come to our attention. So uh, that's a lot of beating that the heart has to do. So this is just a review of old school anatomy of the heart. This is a heart sliced open that kind of shows the normal traffic flow uh, through the heart. So blood that either returns from the upper extremities or lower extremities goes into what's called the upper chamber or the right atrium, and then it goes into the right ventricle, this bottom chamber, out to the lungs for us to breathe in air and exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the blood. Then it returns back to the upper chamber on the left side, called the left atrium, out into this main engine of the heart, which we call the left ventricle. And that is the, the, the workhorse, and, and many problems that we see and treat on a daily basis are related to problems that manifest with this, in this left ventricle, which is the main engine. So blood leaves there and goes through the aorta and out to the body and all of our necessary organs. And so again, in review, the atria are the upper chambers, um, that receive blood, and then they pump to the ventricles, which are the bottom chambers that pump blood out. The right ventricle pumps to the uh, lungs and the left ventricle out to the, to the body. That's just the background so we can understand what goes on with the anatomy. And so the next couple of minutes, we're going to talk about heart valve problems that can lead to heart murmurs. They're the most common cause of uh, disturbances uh, with the valves, are the most common cause of murmurs. So, the heart valves, just imagine them like doors to a room. They have to open and close and open and close to allow blood to travel through the heart in one direction. Um, and so problems can occur in either one of these functions. And so we, we have a little picture of what the valves look like. They look like little pieces of cellophane tissue. This is the tricuspid valve. This is a right-sided valve. The pulmonary valve is here, which we don't really have a lot of problems that develop of, of significance or importance with the pulmonary valve. And the vast majority of valve problems that we treat in cardiology are related to either the aortic valve or the mitral valve, which are the, the, the valves that deal with that left side or that main engine, that left ventricle. But that's sort of what they look like. And their function, again, if you keep in mind that they're sort of like doors to a room that open and close. And so what is a murmur? Uh, a murmur is, a, is the actual sound that's made that we can hear and detect with the stethoscope. And it's, it, it sounds, you know, it's described in many different ways, either like a swishing or whooshing sound, but it's the sound that's heard when, when a doctor listens to your chest. Um, and it's, it's usually an extra sound between the heartbeats, and it can be very faint and barely audible or very loud. Uh, usually indicative of, of either more or less importance. So there are certain conditions that can exist whereby the murmur is not really anything to worry about. It can be an innocent or benign murmur, and that's different settings. So certainly pregnant women, almost all pregnant women will have a, a, what we call a normal murmur just from the extra work that the heart has to do to pump to the baby. If you have things like fever you know, or, or a low blood count, the heart's maybe working a little bit harder or after vigorous exercise, it's not uncommon to hear a murmur, <clears throat> which is just the sound that the heart makes when it's squeezing a little harder and more forcefully. Um, there's a condition where if your thyroid gland is overactive, it can rev things up such that a murmur can be heard in that setting. But oftentimes, it's an innocent murmur that doesn't require much else other than just acknowledging that it's there. But there are many abnormal uh, uh, heart murmurs. Um, in childhood, uh, the, the pediatric cardiologists will often discover things like holes in the heart where there's mixing of blood. The, the, the oxygenated blood and the non-oxygenated blood can mix and can create this turbulent sound. Most of these murmurs are, are from 
turbulence or, or rather than the smooth, easy flow through the heart, if there's turbulence, then that's what can be heard. Um, we'll spend the next little bit talking about heart valve problems, but there are other conditions. Rheumatic fever is something that we don't see a whole lot in the United States anymore because of the availability of antibiotics, but still there's an occasional patient who has rheumatic heart disease from childhood that I'll see as an adult cardiologist that manifests with heart valve problems. Um, valve calcification is something that we don't fully understand. It's something that can just go along with aging. Um, um, and it's not really related to how much calcium you take in in your diet or by supplementation. It's just something that can happen in some people and we don't fully understand it. Then mitral valve prolapse, and we, we probably have some patients in here with prolapse that either know it or don't know it, but it, this is very, very common for us to see. And it can lead to problems with the mitral valve that can cause murmurs and eventual uh, problems. So the two major disturbances that can occur with a uh, heart valve is either it can't open right or it can't close right. And so our term for a valve that won't open all the way is stenosis uh, or hardening of that valve. And if the valve doesn't close well, we call it a leaky valve or a regurgitant valve. And so those are the two major things that can happen. And just imagine again that door, just imagine it can't open all the way or can't close all the way. And it can allow, in the heart's case, blood to transfer uh, back and forth between the chambers or have difficulty in the heart squeezing against it. So um, this, is a, this is an actual patient of mine that went to surgery and the surgeon took out his heart valve and you can imagine this little space here is the channel through which all the blood leaving this patient's body had to be forced through here and it caused a very loud murmur that in turn made this person's heart work extra hard and after we uh, uh, you know, sorted all that out, they went to surgery and had a valve replacement for, in this case, aortic stenosis. So normally that opening is about as wide as my, my fingers are illustrating here, but this little channel was, uh, was the problem that, that we discovered. So the heart has to work extra hard, and sometimes the organs can suffer, and, and the heart itself can suffer if this problem is not alleviated. And that's called stenosis, or hardening. On the other hand, regurgitation is when the opposite problem doesn't exist, uh, the, the opposite problem exists where the uh, valve just doesn't close all the way and it allows blood to flow backwards against the grain. So like a car going up the wrong way against traffic and there's a lot of turbulence that is created when there's that leaking and the heart has to work twice as hard to, to do the same thing. And the heart can handle that for a certain period of time, but over time it can cause the heart to, to work itself out and tire and lead to symptoms like congestive heart failure congestive heart failure. Um, many times this does not require treatment and it's something that's just observed, but in patients who are symptomatic from it or if we see a change in the shape or the function of the heart, then we indeed do have to do something to, to, to fix it. So again, this is a normal heart's anatomy and these pictures may not project fully across the room, but this shows the, a couple of the major problems that can cause murmurs. And again, that's the sound that we hear. In the case of a pediatric cardiologist who might notice that there's a communication between the chambers of the heart, in this case this oxygenated blood is mixing with the non-oxygenated blood through a murmur that um, is from a VSD, a ventricular septal defect, or a hole that develops. Often this little hole can close off and so some people are uh, noted to have a murmur in their childhood that just kind of goes away and that's uh, usually the case. Um, in, in adults, we see this where this valve sort of pinches the blood and creates this jet velocity that we can hear with the stethoscope. Um, we can sometimes hear it up in the neck because those carotid arteries come right off the aorta, right sort of behind your ear. And so we usually will listen. If we will listen at the heart. And I have a slide that shows where we listen, but we also can listen for places where this sound can be reflected in other parts of the, the body or the blood vessel. Uh, so this is a stenosis or narrow valve and this shows a leaky valve where instead of that valve closing tightly shut and this cartoon shows a little prolapse to this little bowing of the valve allows blood to leak backwards towards the lungs. And so the, that's the main cause of those murmurs. So when you go to the doctor, there are different places where the doctor puts the stethoscope over your chest with the goal of trying to identify problems with each of these four valves. And so there are different um, parts that tend to reflect problems with each of the different valves based upon where 
uh, you, where you listen. And so um, this is the whole concept of why you might notice your doctor to kind of move that stethoscope around to try to identify those, those things. And the things that we're asking ourselves are how loud is it? How prominent is it? Where is it? Does it radiate? Does it go into the neck? Does it go under the arm? Does it go to the back? Does it go down? Um, you know, if we have you breathe in and breathe out in certain parts of listening, it's to identify the valve and the problem. And uh, what part of the heart's beating is it mostly occurring in? I mean, there are certain factors that can make you more likely to get a murmur. Um, if you have untreated high blood pressure, which can cause the heart over time, or untreated or uncontrolled blood pressure, can cause the heart to enlarge or weaken. And that can pull those valve leaflets apart and cause leaking. Um, uh, prior rheumatic fever, which we talked about, there's also people with previous infection. I told the story last session about a patient of mine that used to abuse drugs in his younger days, and he chewed up his tricuspid valve, and that thing is so loud we can just listen barely with the stethoscope on his chest and hear this loud murmur um, from that, um, which he never required surgery on. It just sort of healed partially, but the valve doesn't close very well. Prior heart attacks can weaken certain parts of the the valve structure and, and cause leaking. Um, radiation has evolved over the years and um, you know, we have some cancer survivors who previously got radiation to the chest. In the old days when they used to apply the radiation widely to a big field, that was more of a problem then than it is now where they tend to localize that radiation beam right on the, uh, the, the site where the cancer is. And it's a little bit less of an issue, but radiation doesn't know just to treat cancer cells. It kind of it affects every cell in its path. Um, or if you have an enlarged or weakened heart muscle like a cardiomyopathy, that can just pull those leaflets a apart and cause leaking. So what are the signs and symptoms of valve disease or, or um, uh, you know, significant murmurs? Well, classically, it's heart failure symptoms, which usually include shortness of breath, uh, difficulty with effort or exertion, uh, swelling of the legs, abdominal bloating sometimes. Um, this bluish discoloration would probably be more reflective of a, a, a child who's got a shunt or even an adult who might still have a shunt that was never uh, treated. Uh, coughing could be a sign of congestion in the lungs at times. Uh, doctors are always scoping out patients' neck veins and if they're big and juicy, some people are made like that, but sometimes that's indicative of a heart valve problem. Um, dizziness or fainting if it's uh, particularly in a patient with aortic stenosis. And I just had a patient pass out while he was working at the plant and we found that he had a condition called a bicuspid valve, which meant that he was born with two leaflets on his valve instead of three, um, which, which uh, he had been told about a murmur at age, age 18. He's 40 now, and so he wound up going to heart surgery for that. Um, and chest pain sometimes can, can, can be a manifestation as things get more advanced. So the main test that we use to assess heart murmurs beyond the stethoscope is a test called an echocardiogram, which is illustrated here. This technologist is taking a picture of this patient's heart where we can see the heart beating on the screen, and we usually can see the heart valve structures very well with that test. Um, these other modalities are available. They're a little more cumbersome and, and sometimes more costly for insurance, but the, the most common test is an echocardiogram. A chest x-ray can tell us the size of the heart uh, to some degree, an EKG can tell us if there are manifestations on the heart's uh, electrical system, which we're going to talk about in the second half. But again, a murmur is not a disease. It's a manifestation of something. It could either be a normal scenario or it could be an anatomic disturbance that's causing this turbulence. And so we just say, you know, there's nothing special you can do to prevent a murmur other than you know, live a good heart healthy, heart healthy life. Um, so when should you see a cardiologist? When, who, who with a murmur should see a, a heart specialist? Now most cardiologists who are doing this say, well, everybody, but that's not really the case. You know. But this is a real patient, um, and this is a patient who is 56 years old. It's a 56-year-old woman who has been bringing her mother to see me for a couple of years. And she herself wound up in a hospital who will, that will rena remain anonymous, um, uh, with shortness of, she went in with shortness of breath, swelling of her legs, she couldn't put her head on the pillow at night, and she was diagnosed, and this is our medical lingo, she was discharged home on this date with the first diagnosis of acute systolic heart failure, which means her heart wasn't functioning properly, 
and she was found to have severe MR, which is mitral regurgitation, or severe leaking of her valve, and significant leaking of a second valve. So she had two leaky valves, aortic insufficiency is what that means, two leaking valves, and the doctors that were caring for her did not ask a cardiologist to see her. And so I was very frustrated by that. Now, fortunately, she came to see me because she knew me from uh, caring for her mother. And certainly, I didn't need to see her, but some cardiologists should have seen her. Um, because the tragedy in this case would be that if time just, if it's left to, to its um, you know, own natural history, she's going to wind up with the heart in a couple of years that we can't do anything with. It's going to be enlarged and weak, and no surgeon's going to want to uh, touch her with a heart that's ruined when, you know, if a patient comes in like this and they're healthy enough and appropriate for surgery, she, she, needs, she needs valve surgery um, sooner than later, which is in the works for us now. So um, if you've had, when should you see a doctor? So, so certainly if you've had a murmur for years and years and years, you just want to be sure that it's an innocent or benign murmur. So, and I see patients all the time, oh, I've always had a murmur. Well, some of them, you know, you, you just don't want to miss the boat if you happen to have one of those murmurs that should have gotten attention because there is a window of time in which we can do something to, to correct the problem if it needs correcting. And there's, beyond that window, sometimes we're, you know, the risks of surgery now, the risk of doing something with the valve exceed the benefit. Um, if it's associated with things like shortness of breath or other heart failure symptoms like swelling in the legs or bloating in the abdomen or uh, being unable to take care of your daily activities, certainly if it's causing fainting or blackout spells, that's something that really should be evaluated. Um, chest pain is, is, is a very significant marker if it's related to the murmur. And uh, palpitations or a sensation of irregular beating of the heart. Um, those would be any of these things. I would, if the doctors told you that you've had a murmur, if you have any of these things, you should at least have an echocardiogram, if not a formal evaluation. Um, anyway, palpitations brings us to uh, part two, and so um, this is a a movie that shows the normal electrical pathways of the heart. And so the heart is a muscle, but there has to be something that drives the muscle to, to beat, and that's the electrical system of the heart. So in most of us, the heartbeat starts at this little button that we call the SA node or the sinoatrial node, and that drives a normal heartbeat to cause this normal EKG, and these impulses at the top tell both of those upper chambers to beat simultaneously, and it conducts through this piece of tissue called the AV node uh, to cause both chambers at the bottom to beat essentially simultaneously, and that's a normal setting. And so again, out of those 2.5 lifetime, 2.5 billion lifetime heartbeats, a lot can go wrong here to cause uh, symptoms. And so, um, you know, there's certain terms that we use to kind of discuss this, and you know, the talk is about palpitations, but uh, palpitations are often a manifestation of arrhythmias of the heart, and then an arrhythmia is an abnormal beating of the heart, and certainly if they continue and they're persistent, persistent and, and or sustained, it can cause problems with the heart and affect uh, flow to the organs and, and cause symptoms of heart failure, sometimes stroke and some other conditions that we'll talk about. And so any change from the normal sequence of beating of the heart is what an arrhythmia is. And it can either be too fast or too slow or erratic and just out of any regular rhythm. And when it doesn't beat properly, then the heart doesn't uh, uh, get blood to the organs like we, like we talked about. And so this often occurs without us knowing. It's a very common problem. Almost everyone has at least an early beat or skip beat from time to time. But the vast majority of people aren't aware of this. And, and those aren't really so important. It's the ones that are persistent and sustain and cause the heart to beat uh, less efficiently that can be much more important. Those um, that are sustained can sometimes cause lightheadedness or fainting or blackout spells and again it's very common to have this without even knowing it um, but again if it, if it lasts then they can even be deadly and so what, there, there, there are plenty of causes and it can certainly happen in a normal heart but in certain heart abnormalities it's much more common. Heart valve disease is one of the major causes of irregular beating of the heart so one of the things that we always do when we see patients with this complaint 
is we want to make sure that the heart is anatomically normal because a normal heart that has irregular beating, we know that it tends to be more of a nuisance than anything dangerous. Um, but patient, patients who have enlargement of the heart or weak heart, these heartbeat disturbances can be more of a problem and have certain implications. It can certainly be from an overactive thyroid gland, certain medications, certain you know, cough and cold medications can have uh, decongestants, which are stimulants that can trigger a rapid beating of the heart. Uh, there are certain minerals that are necessary for the heart to beat properly. Magnesium and potassium are two of the most common ones. And so if you have abnormally high or low levels of either of these, that can trigger abnormal beating of the heart. Um, it can be related to stress or anxiety or panic attacks, uh, you know, caffeine, certain diet pills. Um, there's, you know, it seems like every kid is diagnosed with ADD or ADHD now, and certainly some of those stimulants can, can trigger fast heartbeats. And, you know, some of my younger patients who are on some of these medications, I actually see them in the office with those complaints. Fever uh, can, can rev up the heart, and again, certain, even asthma uh, medications. So, a palpitation is actually the major manifestation of an irregular beating of the heart. And so just, just for the sake of definition, and it's a feeling, a palpitation is a feeling or a sensation that the heart's beating out of sequence. And we hear all sorts of descriptions of what this feels like, you know, butterflies in the chest. You can feel it beating, you know, in, in the ear at night when you lie in bed. Um, you feel in the chest or your throat or your, your neck. It's just an awareness of the heart sort of beating out of sequence. And again, it's usually from there being some little disturbance of the normal sequence of the beating of the heart. And so uh, this sensation of butterflies uh, may give a patient a feeling of, of skipping beats when actually the heart's not really skipping. We use that term, but what can happen is if the heart beats early, it tends to pause and reset itself. And so it's usually the beat after the early beat that patients feel because the heart's more full and that beat can be fairly strong. It can go up into the neck or the ears. And we, we hear that quite a bit. And that's what's uh, described here. This, this sensation of this skip is really usually from an early beat before the heart's had a, a chance to fill. So again, the normal heart rate is 60 to 100 times a minute. And certainly in many normal patients, it can be a little bit higher than that uh, or even a little bit lower. We see some, you know, Athletes and highly trained people come in with heart rates in the 40s and 50s at times, and they're completely asymptomatic. And some people are sitting uh, in the office with a heart rate of 105, 110, and they feel perfectly fine. Um, so everyone's normal is different, but generally speaking, 60 to 100. And over 100, we call tachycardia, or fast heart, and less than 60, we call bradycardia, or slow heart. And an extra systole is a beat out of sequence, or uh, we give it, it's called a PVC if it occurs um, from the bottom, or a PAC if it occurs at the top. So when I was in med school, they actually showed this video of this professor who wanted to give us a good understanding of the normal heart beating. So that's this guy showing the, his arms are the atria and his legs are the ventricles. So that's the <laughs> normal beating from top to bottom. It just kind of helps understand what the normal sequence of beating of the heart is. And so likewise, uh, he shows what a beat out of sequence might look like in the heart. So, and he's wearing himself out too, he's getting tired. So, but he <laughs> this shows this normal beat where the atria are beating at the top and the ventricles just kind of jerk out of sequence. And that to patients is how it feels sometimes. And so, um, you know, it's a little humorous, but it actually expresses the point very well what an I mean, this is what a PVC really looks like, uh, where that, that bottom chamber is just beating out of sequence like that. So anyway, again, tachycardia is when the heart's going a little too fast. Um, in that setting, the, the heart, the major engine, doesn't have time to fill itself. And so sometimes we see patients with low blood pressure when their heart's going fast, um, especially if they're dehydrated, they can actually faint. Um, and so in, in that setting, the the, the heart may not have time to fill, uh, to, to provide blood flow to the organs. This is another look at the normal electrical beating of the heart. Again, that SA node stimulates the atria, the AV node transfers this energy, uh, this impulse to the ventricles to cause this normal top to bottom beating. The vast majority of these heartbeat disturbances are benign and usually a nuisance. And we make a distinction between 
irregular heartbeats that come from the top, which we call supraventricular. So some of you may have heard the term SVT. SVT refers to heartbeat problems that occur from up here. But that's opposed to problems that come from the bottom, which are called ventricular arrhythmias. And they can be very dangerous, if not fatal. Um, and so we make that distinct, distinction right off, whether they're supraventricular or ventricular arrhythmias. But again, the vast majority of things that we see patients in the office for are for benign conditions. So atrial fibrillation is a very, very, very common heartbeat disturbance. And I'll say that I see this literally every workday. I see at least one patient with this. It affects over, and I think they gave you a pamphlet, and um, a lot of the data that you see up here is based upon uh, some of the notes on your page. But it's, a re it's an irregular, chaotic sort of beating um, more than two million people in the in the U.S. are affected by this. It's a little more common in certain populations, as, as in, in elderly patients or patients with high blood pressure. And sometimes that top chamber is actually quivering about 300 times a minute. Unfortunately, the way God made us, the bottom doesn't go that fast because if you if the bottom goes that fast, we're usually on the floor or, or worse. Um, and so. It's important because it has some implications. So although you can live with atrial fibrillation, it can put you at risk for other things. It can cause the heart to beat a little bit less efficiently. And so if you already have something wrong with your heart and you go into atrial fibrillation, you can become very sick and go into heart failure. You can just feel sort of tired. Um, there is an increased risk of stroke with it. And it often requires that you, you, you take blood thinners if you have the right risk profile. So we see young patients with AFib, as we call it. Uh, we see old patients with AFib and everything in between. So this is electrically what AFib looks like. It's, there's these electrical wavelets being fired from all over the, 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 the top of the heart, and it causes the bottom to try to chase it. And so the the overall manifestation is going to depend usually on how fast the bottom is trying to chase it. And some people walk into the office where they're an AFib at 140, and some people, you know, their heart rates are 70 if they're on other medications that might keep the heart from going so fast. We've, there are actually several different types of AFib, and most of it we think comes from this right atrium, but there's some that we think comes from the left atrium, which can be treated with a procedure called ablation. Um, so this is our nutty professor showing us what AFib looks like. And so he's done a good job, and so he's about to pass out from doing all this. But he's showing that AFib is just a chaotic beating from the top, and the bottom's just trying to chase it. So, um, and it's irregular. He, he, he has no, no rhythm here with his, with his manifestation. So this, uh, this is a, the EKG from a 45-year-old uh, otherwise healthy guy whose heart rate was found to be 100 and 24 and greater uh, beats a minute. This is actually my EKG when I went into atrial fibrillation last year. So um, again, this isn't supposed to happen to me. I treat this, but I was literally, it was a Sunday of the Masters. I was laying on my couch watching the Masters golf uh, tournament last year. I remember exactly when it started. And um, my doctor, who's getting ready to leave, my wife, is uh, uh, you know, I'm a hard-headed patient like all doctors, and so I didn't want to believe it. I didn't, I said, well, I feel fine. I don't need to do anything with this. And so um, doctors also like to treat themselves, and so I prescribed some medications for myself. This was a Sunday, and so um, the medications didn't work. And uh, Monday morning I got up and still kind of felt my pulse. It felt a little bit irregular. It was still racing, but I had a bunch of patients to see, so I couldn't disappoint them, so I kept on working. Uh, and then I had two heart procedures to do that afternoon and got through it just fine. Then I had enough, and so I asked my partners, uh, and I said, would you guys mind giving me a little shock so I can get rid of this? And so they put me to sleep for a second, and I got a cardioversion, so I got shocked and went on home and went to work the next day. So um, it's, you know, and, and this is my story. My heart is otherwise anatomically normal, but it can happen. Um, so it can happen in people with sick hearts and otherwise normal hearts. And occasionally I still feel a little, two or three little irregular beats at a time. Um, I take a little aspirin now. Um, 
and, and nothing else, but some people require continued medications to keep this from happening. So anyway, the, the, the tests that are usually done to assess for palpitations could be a monitor. And this guy is wearing this little, we call this a Holter monitor. There are many, many different types of monitors that can be worn. Uh, there are longer term ones. These, this is a short term monitor and EKG is a standard to assess this. An echocardiogram to look for structural problems. Chest x-ray to make sure the heart's not enlarged. And we're very, very excited about this. Uh, the rep from this particular company came to my office yesterday with this new device. And so they are implantable devices. Because the frustration in treating palpitations is that it might happen today and not for another week. Or it might happen today and not for six months. And when we see patients like that, it's like your car when it makes a noise, but when you bring it to the mechanic, it's purring fine. And so it's frustrating for us because we have difficulty catching it. So we do have these monitors which we can implant. So this is a, a, what's called an implantable loop recorder that can be put under the skin, but they just miniaturize this. This is the size of, smaller than a cigarette uh, lighter, and this is smaller than my finger. Um, and there's a little device where we can put this under the skin in less than a minute, and it can stay under the skin for a couple of years. And so if there's a question about someone's heart rhythm, we can just interrogate this thing and see what's going on. So this is pretty slick, and we're really excited about that. So um, again, there are certain substances that can trigger heartbeat problems. Uh, caffeine always comes up, but there are some obviously illegal drugs, but even prescription drugs, cold medicines, asthma medicines that can, that can uh, precipitate this. Uh, chocolate, 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 Valentine's Day chocolate can trigger this in some people. Tea, that it has a substance called theobromin, which is chemically very similar to caffeine. So go easy on the chocolate. Um, and certainly alcohol. And there is a condition that we call holiday heart, where patients might go to a cocktail party and have a couple of extra drinks and then come into the ER with a fast heartbeat. And, and that certainly is, you know, I had a, a casino employee. Um, he had gotten sauced up the night before and he went to work the next day and felt really funny and almost fainted and came in in atrial fibrillation. And again, I wasn't drinking when I had my uh, episode of AFib, I promise you. Uh, um, but anyway, high blood pressure, if the heart gets thickened or enlarged or if you have a cardiomyopathy or heart failure, irregular heartbeats are very common. So when should you see a doctor? Certainly if you have any of these symptoms above, particularly if it's occurring very frequently, if you're lightheaded, if you have heart failure symptoms, if it's continuous, then that certainly requires attention to make sure it's nothing dangerous. If it happens very frequently or if it's very bothersome and you can't get through your work day or your school day, then there are medicines that are highly effective in controlling this. But really you want to make sure that you don't have something that requires more investigation or that the palpitations are not indicative of a bigger problem. Um, that needs more, more therapy. So again, if the heart's racing or you're feeling faint or lightheaded, if they're bothersome, then uh, get, it, get it checked out. So again, you know, is it preventable? Uh, not always. Uh, I mean, I thought I was doing the right thing myself. I mean, exercise, um, but it can just sort of happen. If there are triggers like caffeine or medication, then those can be changed or avoided. Um, and then you just live a good heart-healthy lifestyle otherwise, and that's the best defense that we have right now.